Now, in our fifth episode on Foundations of Christian Hedonism, we are focusing on argument number four for the point we made in the first session, namely that Christian Hedonism affirms that it is the God-given duty of all people to pursue the fullest, longest pleasure, namely pleasure in God. It's a duty, not a mere privilege, not an opportunity, not a suggestion, a command, a duty of everyone on the planet that God has made that we pursue our fullest, longest pleasure in God, and we drew that first from Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path. This is the path we're to dutifully follow. The path of life, namely the path that leads to your presence, God, and you point out that when we get there, what we find is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Father, as we look now at argument number four for why this duty is biblical, grant, I pray, that we would know the nature of conversion. And if any of us is not converted, that you would work that miracle even through this episode of Look at the Book. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's argument number four. We should pursue... God in Christ, and I I put it in hyphens like that so that you would see that sometimes I speak of Christ as what we pursue as our joy, and sometimes I say God, sometimes I say God in Christ, all that God is for us in Christ, and Christ is the focus here, but I didn't want you to think we were leaving behind the point that God is our satisfaction. I consider them virtually interchangeable. We should pursue God in Christ as our most satisfying treasure because genuine conversion to Christ is, this is what the essence of genuine conversion is, the awakening, the coming awake to Christ as supremely valuable. When a person wakes up to the conviction and truth, beauty of the truth, that Christ is supremely valuable, conversion has happened. Consider in support of that, Matthew 13, 44, two tiny parables of Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. So the kingdom of heaven here would be, one way to say it would be, the experience of the rule of God in your life. If if God comes as king and ruler in your life and is the supreme authority in your life, the kingdom of God comes, here's what it looks like. It's like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up Because evidently the law in that time was that if you owned a land, you could also have whatever treasure was in it. So he covered it up, and then in his joy, and for a long time I didn't notice that little phrase in reading this. I just kind of read over it, and then he goes and sells all that he has. No, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has. Now picture this. He's selling all his furniture. He's selling his books. He's selling his computer. He's selling his house. And everybody thinks he's an idiot. It's like Noah building an ark in the desert. You've lost your mind. Well, he has not lost his mind because if he can get enough money To buy that field, he knows this treasure is worth billions of times more than all that he just sold. He'll have it back. Yes, he will. (laughs) And eternal life. So, to be converted is be walking through life in love with all that you have. 
It's your treasure, and you live for what you own and what you can get and the relationships that you have, all that this world offers. You're living for that. And suddenly, your eyes are opened to Christ, the true treasure of the universe. And you see him as so infinitely more valuable than everything else. You cross a line. It's called conversion. Over here, you're in love with the world. Over here, you're in love with Christ. And at this line, it is like, sometimes in reality, you do it. Sometimes you do it in principle, but you always do it. You sell everything you have to have the field where the treasure is. That's conversion. The shifting of what you are satisfied by supremely from the world onto Christ. He just tells it again here in a different form. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl, Christ, the king in the kingdom. One pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Consider John three nineteen. This is the judgment that light has come into the world. Jesus as bright and beautiful light has come into the world, satisfying light, life-giving light, light that shows you where to go and how to live and not to fall into destruction. And people loved darkness rather than the light because their works were evil for everyone who does evil or wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. Now, the point of this text, the reason I'm putting it in front of you, is to show that what needs to happen in conversion, what needs to happen is not a change of opinion, not a change of intellectual conviction, merely. What must happen is a change in what you love and what you hate. People love darkness. There are all kinds of reasons why they love darkness. They love broken cisterns. They love suicidal habits. And they hate Christ. They hate light and all that light brings into their life in terms of godliness and purity and holiness and an all-satisfying experience of Jesus as the infinite authority and treasure of the universe. So what's needed in conversion is you got to stop loving the darkness. you got to stop hating the light. Now, here's a description from Paul how that happens. 2 Corinthians 4. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. And here comes the remedy for this blindness. Here. Here's the remedy. For God who said... Let light shine out of darkness at the beginning when he created the world has done the same thing now in our hearts. He has shown in our hearts to give the light. So he's overcoming the blindness that causes us to hate the light, be closed to the light, turn away from the light because the God of this world is Satan and he hates the light. He hates Christ. He has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's conversion. The opening of our blind eyes to stop hating light and love the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And that glory is a matter of great joy, as Paul makes clear here in Romans 5. Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. When Paul thinks of the glory of God, 
He knows that it is profoundly satisfying. And if we look forward to the full experience of it in the age to come, we rejoice even now. So when he says that the glory of God is being revealed to us by God taking away the blindness, showing us the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, or showing us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, he is talking about the discovery of joy. One last text quickly before we stop on this episode. Deuteronomy, a picture of new covenant promise, what God promises is going to happen in conversion. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart. That's a picture of cutting away everything insensitive and uh, unhealthy, un godly about your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God. So he's going to do a miracle here on our hearts to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul that we may live. Conversion is a miracle on the heart causing love for the heart, with the totality of our heart, love from the heart, all of it. So, my answer or my description of the fourth argument for why we should pursue God as our treasure is this. We should pursue God in Christ as our most satisfying treasure because genuine conversion, as Jesus describes it, Paul describes it, Moses promises it, because genuine conversion to Christ is the awakening to Christ as supremely valuable. Next time, we turn to argument number five, that the very nature of saving faith shows that we should pursue our fullest pleasure in God.